Dear students, uh, we are going to have our second uh, lecture in this special form, which you will be able to see uh, through video. Uh, there is one important information uh, which uh, you might not have heard until now, and it is that the next week uh, there will be a normal uh, education, so it will be a normal week, not uh, as if it uh, was planned originally. Uh, you surely know uh, it uh, ought to have been a, a so-called training uh, week with special lectures, special programs uh, for professors and for students both. But uh, as it is impossible now, uh, the decision was taken today in the morning uh, that uh, the next week uh, there will be a normal week uh, with normal uh, lectures and uh, seminaries. So it means uh, that uh, you are invited uh, to look uh, at uh, your uh, email uh, through uh, the Neptune and uh, then you will be able to find uh, the video about uh, the next uh, week's lecture too. In fact, I have to say that uh, it is really a very good news for us. Uh, uh, in a sense, I could even say that uh, I have a re really prophetic uh, soul because uh, when I consulted uh, the syllabus, uh, uh, which you could find uh, in the Moodle, then uh, I realized that, that uh, for today's lecture, I didn't put uh, in the syllabus a date. So it means uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, this uh, course uh, consists of 12 uh, lectures, but in fact, uh, normally uh, we uh, might have had only 11 occasions uh, for classes. So it means that it's only uh, due to this uh, new decision, uh, thanks to coronavirus, uh, that we shall be able to go through the whole uh, of our course. So it means uh, that uh, that uh, the next week uh, we shall have, in fact, uh, uh, the lecture which uh, which uh, we might have had uh, today. Now let's uh, come uh, to our concrete uh, topic, uh, which is. Uh, already about uh, the New Testament. Uh, you know, up until now we had two lectures uh, generally about uh, the Bible and sacred literature and uh, Christianity and uh, the Jewish religion. And then we had four other ones uh, which were about uh, the Old Testament. And then now we shall begin uh, with uh, the New Testament. Uh, we plan to have five lectures, five classes uh, about this topic. And then uh, the very last occasion would be a little bit uh, about uh, the church history, which also means uh, about uh, how uh, the Bible uh, lived uh, for 2,000 years uh, in the faith, in the life, in the morals uh, of uh, different societies uh, through the Christian religion, uh, first of all, the Christian religion. So what I'm going to speak about now uh, consists of two parts. The first will be a general introduction uh, to the New Testament, uh, New Testament and Christianity, the books of the New Testament, uh, a little uh, uh, more in detail uh, as uh, what we had uh, some uh, four or five uh, weeks uh, before, and then about the so-called synoptic uh, and uh, uh, Gospels uh, and uh, the Gospel of uh, John itself, uh, the, the concept, uh, the genre of the Gospels. And then in the second half of uh, our class, uh, we shall deal, as normally, with some concrete texts uh, from the New Testament. Uh, those ones uh, which seem to be the most important, or at least characteristic, uh, of uh, the life of uh, Jesus. So, let us begin uh, with the New Testament age and uh, Christianity. Uh, as you surely remember, we were speaking about the so-called intertestamental period, uh, which uh, is the period uh, between uh, the Old Testament uh, and uh, the New Testament age. And we said that uh, the Old Testament uh, it is not quite true, but at least uh, the overwhelming majority of uh, the books of the Old Testament uh, 
existed up until, uh, let's say, the 4th century before Christ. And then, uh, evidently, uh, the New Testament uh, will begin uh, writing uh, of uh, the documents of the New Testament uh, in the 1st uh, century A.D., Anno Domini, uh, you must know, uh, there is sometimes misunderstanding, even English people sometimes think that A.D. means after death, after the death of Jesus, but that's not true. A.D. means uh, from the Latin word Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. So, it begins uh, evidently with the first century, and it is in the middle of the first century that the first books uh, of uh, the New Testament uh, were born. Between the two, we have 400 years, about 400 years, which is the intertestamental uh, period uh, or age. As I said, it's not quite true, because uh, some uh, little parts uh, of uh, the Old Testament, and especially the book of Daniel and some chapters from other books, uh, were written in this so-called uh, intertestamental uh, period. And also it is true uh, that... Uh, there were some modifications, uh, some uh, uh, new collections uh, made from uh, uh, existing uh, writings uh, of the Old Testament, uh, which were created in this age. Uh, so it's not perfectly, but up to 90% it is correct uh, if we say that there is uh, at least uh, 400 years, uh, which we can uh, say uh, is the intertestamental age. When uh, nothing happens, and uh, when I say nothing happens, it uh, does not only mean uh, that uh, there are no or almost uh, no books uh, of the, all of the Bible that were born at that time, but the things, uh, this, uh, this means uh, uh, something uh, even more important, uh, something uh, concerning uh, the content uh, of uh, the religion. If you remember, uh, we could say uh, that one of the most important uh, characteristics uh, of uh, the Old Testament religion, and now I say the Old Testament religion, was uh, a fantastic uh, dynamism. A dynamism which means uh, that there were always new and new ideas uh, that arrived. Uh, especially, uh, not only, but especially this was characteristic of the prophets, uh, who always uh, uh, went back uh, uh, to some tradition, to some, uh, some part uh, of uh, that uh, enormous tradition which they had in their religion and uh, in their, uh, their writings, uh, and they reinterpreted it. They uh, gave some new interpretation. They looked uh, for some, uh, some understanding uh, which uh, could be a concrete message for their age. So this was very important. And this is something which you have to, uh, to have in your mind, that when we speak about the Old Testament religion, it doesn't mean, as it is normally with religions, that uh, there are some myths uh, in the past, uh, and then uh, that uh, plays uh, uh, somehow a de uh, uh, determining role in the life, in the religion uh, of uh, a community, of a society. But, uh, uh, it is dynamism. It is being on the road, going uh, and turning right and left and uh, going further. There were always new and new things uh, uh, that happened uh, in uh, this history, up until the end of the Old Testament period. And then what happens after is that uh, instead uh, of dynamism, uh, we have, uh, in fact, uh, the opposite of it. Uh, we have uh, some very stable, very immovable uh, state of the religion uh, of the Jews. Uh, I do not want uh, to go back again and to explain what was uh, uh, the reason of it. Uh, you might uh, uh, remember that it was because of that, uh, that enormous fear uh, uh, that uh, Yahweh, their God, should not again be at, uh, in anger with them and give a punishment. And so they saw that uh, they have to build out totally and perfectly 
the system of what God wants from them and then to observe all those laws. Anyway, what's important for us is that uh, after many hundred years uh, of exceptional, absolutely exceptional dynamism, what comes uh, is uh, an extreme, we could really say an extreme uh, sort uh, of, uh, of static uh, religion. And that is characteristic uh, of uh, the Jews in this intertestamental age. And this is the explanation of why there aren't uh, really great uh, new ideas appearing in their religion. There are smaller changes, uh, evidently, but there is nothing uh, which could be compared to what happened before it for many hundred years. Now, when we arrive at the age of the New Testament, uh, what we see is that there is again an explosion, I could say, a spiritual explosion. There is again something, a new dynamism, uh, bigger than ever before, uh, which uh, is centered around the person of uh, Jesus Christ. So, dynamism, then after it, uh, some very static uh, situation, in the religion, and then again comes something uh, which is very, very uh, dynamic. Now, uh, what begins uh, uh, in the first century, uh, centered around Jesus Christ, as I said to you, will become uh, a new religion. Will become a new religion in a development not from one minute to the other. Uh, this means uh, that not in a very long uh, story, uh, let's say in some decades, but uh, however from steps to step uh, will uh, be uh, elaborated, uh, uh, will appear what we call the Christianity, a new religion which uh, in all respects uh, is bound very tightly to the Old Testament, uh, to the religion uh, of uh, the Old Testament, the Jewish religion. However, it will be a new religion, another religion. What is uh, the essence uh, of it? We could say that for the Christian religion, Jesus, we shall come to the question if it's Jesus or Jesus Christ or uh, what names uh, we can use, but let us say now, Jesus Christ uh, is the savior or redeemer or deliverer of uh, human beings. That is something absolutely new. No similar personality, no similar role existed in the Old Testament. Even if it is true uh, that uh, as we were speaking about it uh, at our last class, uh, there was uh, the idea of the Messiah, which appeared first of all in the so-called Deuteronomy uh, texts, uh, which in many respects uh, is uh, almost uh, uh, as if it would point uh, uh, to the future, and by Christianity, uh, these texts of Isaiah were interpreted exactly like this. Uh, so, uh, there is uh, something before, however, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, a savior or as redeemer or, or as a deliverer, the, uh, these concepts are very near to each other. We cannot go into details what are the differences. All these three concepts are used. So this is something uh, uh, not only speciality of the Christianity, but it is the essence uh, of uh, Christianity. Now, two other characteristics of the Christian religion in which it differs from the Jewish religion is what is uh, that? Uh, what can happen through Jesus Christ, through through uh, the relation of uh, uh, people to Jesus Christ, uh, is a universal possibility, a universal possibility. It can happen anywhere, 
by anybody belonging to any nation, uh, any cultural background, etc., etc. Uh, and this is a, a real and great change uh, after what was the situation uh, with the Jewish religion, which was the religion of one concrete nation, of the elected people of uh, God. Here again we can say uh, that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this was introduced uh, uh, partly by the Old Testament because uh, uh, approaching uh, the end of the Old Testament age we have ever more prophecies uh, where we read about uh, all the peoples of the world uh, coming uh, to uh, Mount Zion and becoming uh, the, uh, uh, the people uh, of God. So the idea appears there that uh, God sometime will not be only the God uh, of one people, of the Jewish people, but for all the other peoples. However, we can say that this is a fundamental difference if a religion is the religion of one single nation or it is the religion uh, which is opened to everybody in the world. If we want just for one minute to uh, cast a look uh, at the history of religion generally in the world, then we can say uh, that uh, from the great religions uh, that exist now in the world, there is one which is uh, similar uh, to the Jewish religion in this respect, uh, and that is Hinduism. Hinduism is a religion which uh, is uh, the religion uh, of the Hindu people, of the people living in India. You cannot become a Hindu, uh, even uh, if you say that uh, you accept the teachings uh, of uh, Hinduism, uh, you say that uh, you try uh, to follow uh, the customs uh, of uh, that religion, that will not make you a Hindu. Just in the same way as uh, you cannot become a member of a family just saying that I sympathize so very much with uh, family Smith uh, that I will become Smith. Uh, the answer is, I am sorry, you cannot become Smith. Uh, you can be a great friend uh, of the family Smith. Uh, you can sympathize with them. You can even say that I would like to imitate in my life the Smith family because they are so very, very sympathetic. Uh, but you cannot become uh, a Smith by a personal decision. So, this is the situation with the Jewish religion and with the Hinduism. It is the other way round with Christianity uh, and uh, with Islam and with Buddhism, with Buddhism, which are universal religions. And this also means that they are individual religions in the sense that a, an individual person anywhere in the world, in the whole universe, we could say, can take a decision to say that I want to become a Christian. I want to become a Buddhist. I want to become uh, an uh, Islam, uh, be belong to the Islam religion. Uh, so uh, this is something very important and we always could say uh, that uh, uh, this is the point uh, where there is clearly uh, this uh, difference uh, between uh, the Jewish religion and between uh, the Christian uh, religion. Uh, there is a sentence uh, which demonstrates uh, very well this difference, uh, which uh, runs uh, like this in Latin. Uh, they say that Judaeus nascitur uh, Christ sit, which means that you are born Jewish and you become Christian. You can be Jewish only if you are born a Jew, and you can uh, not be, it's important, you cannot be born as a Christian, you can become only a Christian. 
in brackets. It's another question uh, that in historical reality, uh, uh, in, uh, in some parts of the world like Europe, uh, for many hundred years, little children were baptized. It was something absolutely evident that every child was uh, baptized. And so it, uh, it looked like uh, somebody could be born a Christian, but that's not true. You cannot be born a Christian. You can become a Christian in essence. And that was, uh, anyway, uh, uh, the practice also uh, in the first uh, generations uh, of uh, Christian church history, that it were adults who took a decision to say that I want to become a Christian person. And then the baptism happened after a quite uh, uh, long way, uh, which uh, had to be uh, followed uh, by that uh, concrete person. Um, there is another uh, a sort of description what uh, what happens uh, there then uh, in the uh, uh, in the period of uh, the New Testament, uh, which is sometimes formulated so that uh, the Christianity uh, becomes from a Jewish sect a Jewish uh, uh, way of uh, of life to and religion for its own. So it means that at the very beginning, uh, when Christianity appears uh, in history, uh, they seem to be, uh, in fact, the Jews, and there were a lot of uh, uh, different schools uh, in Jewish thinking, and it could be interpreted uh, in a way that uh, among the many uh, schools uh, within Judaism, uh, there is one uh, which is called uh, uh, Christianity. And it is only after some time that uh, Christianity really will become uh, a separate uh, religion. And then once again, uh, I would like to stress uh, that uh, it's a separate religion because uh, it has uh, Jesus Christ in the center of everything in that religion. Jesus Christ as Savior, or as Redeemer, or as Deliverer. And on the other hand, this is a possibility which is offered to everybody in the world, so it's universal and uh, individualistic uh, on the other hand. And then one more, one last remark uh, in this uh, first uh, chapter in the introduction. It is that uh, we can uh, make uh, such a picture about uh, the New Testament and Jesus Christ and the, uh, uh, the birth uh, of uh, this new religion uh, uh, in a way if we say that Jesus uh, offers an interpretation of the whole of the Old Testament. It is an interpretation of everything what happened before. And then Christianity is an interpretation of Jesus Christ, of what happened to Jesus Christ. So, in the center you have uh, the person of Jesus, who on the one hand interprets uh, the past, and on the other hand, uh, he will be interpreted uh, by uh, the Christian uh, faith. Now, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, interpretation, understanding uh, of uh, Jesus Christ uh, uh, will, uh, in fact, uh, be in the shortest uh, form uh, expressed uh, by the name itself, Jesus Christ. We could say Jesus was uh, the personal name uh, of uh, a rabbi, of a miraculous uh, rabbi uh, in the Jewish society in the first decades uh, of uh, uh, the first century uh, uh, Anno Domini. And then Christ uh, means uh, more or less uh, what the Messiah was. It's more or less, not quite, uh, but we could say uh, that uh, it is a Greek word, word uh, for what Messiah means, which means that it was a confession to say that Jesus of uh, Nazareth, 
Jesus uh, from the town of Nazareth was in fact the Messiah the Messiah about whom the Jews uh, were thinking uh, uh, for many uh, during many uh, uh, hundred uh, years and about whom uh, we could read some of the texts uh, from uh, the prophet uh, Isaiah, the so-called Deutero Isaiah uh, books, uh, texts. All right, uh, and then now come, let us come to the second uh, uh, chapter in the introduction, uh, which is uh, about uh, the New Testament. It is uh, uh, some of the informations were told at the very first uh, or second lesson, so I hope uh, uh, you will say, oh, we know it, everything. Uh, we, we learned it, we have all in our mind. If there is perhaps one or two among you who uh, do not have all the informations, then uh, it is worse uh, to tell it once again, that uh, the New Testament, uh, which is uh, just like the Old Testament, uh, a collection uh, of different uh, books, uh, was also uh, created uh, in a, a span of time, but this span of time is much shorter than in the case of the Old Testament. If you remember, we could say that the Old Testament uh, uh, the first texts of it, uh, which we have uh, not in an uh, in, uh, uh, unaltered way, but uh, which we can say that the first texts what we have uh, come from about uh, the 10th uh, century uh, before Christ. And uh, even if we accepted uh, that uh, they were written uh, until uh, the intertestamental uh, age, it is at least uh, 600 years. If we look at, uh, at the concrete texts, uh, what we have uh, about the Old Testament, that, then it is even more, that it is uh, on almost uh, 1,000 years. Now, related to this, uh, the, Old, the New Testament uh, was created in a, uh, in a much shorter uh, period, let's say some 80, perhaps uh, 100 years. Uh, but uh, we should rather say less uh, than in a century. So it means the first ones uh, of the texts uh, uh, were born uh, in the 40s, in the year 40s, uh, in the first century, and uh, the last ones uh, were written at the beginning, uh, let's say, uh, in the first quarter uh, of the second century. So it is two or three generations about uh, uh, in which uh, these books uh, all were written. Uh, the books of the New Testament uh, were, uh, were written in Greek and even those which perhaps or probably were originally uh, first uh, put on paper, not in Greek, even those we have only in Greek. It's quite in, in, uh, important. Uh, so, it means uh, that uh, some of uh, the writings were originally written uh, in Greek, and some of them, only a minority of these texts, uh, were written in good Greek. So it means uh, people wrote them uh, who had really Greek as the mother tongue and uh, who had uh, some literary skill. They were able to, to write uh, good Greek texts. There is another part of them which uh, originally were surely written uh, uh, in Greek, but by people uh, who were not perfect in Greek. And the language that they used was full with so-called Semitisms. It means uh, such, uh, uh, such expressions, uh, such a way of thinking, which was much more typical uh, of the Jewish thinking than of the Greek thinking. And then also uh, there were surely uh, some, uh, some texts which uh, uh, could only exist originally, at least in a verbal, verbal tradition uh, in Aramean language, 
Aramean language, which is a Semitic language, and that was the language that Jesus uh, and his disciples, and generally the, uh, the, the, the Jews living then in Judah, uh, in uh, Judea, uh, used. Uh, so, what Jesus taught uh, could exist uh, first only as a verbal tradition in Aramean language. But then later uh, it was uh, translated uh, for the Greek speaking uh, congregations. And as after some times uh, almost only these uh, congregations survived, what we have it's totally in Greek language from the, uh, uh, from the New Testament uh, uh, writings. Uh, now, this could be uh, an interesting question. I can uh, only make an allusion uh, to this, uh, this very interesting uh, problem that uh, no doubt uh, there is uh, quite a big difference between the Hebrew way of thinking and the Greek way of thinking. Now, if I say Hebrew and Greek way of thinking, uh, I concretely uh, uh, make allusion uh, to the language. The, the two languages uh, uh, seem to have a, a different uh, way of interpreting uh, the world. Uh, perhaps uh, it uh, not only comes uh, from the fact uh, that these uh, two languages come from different uh, uh, language families. Uh, the Greek language is a so-called Indo-European language and the Hebrew language uh, is a Semitic language. It uh, perhaps uh, comes not only from this fact, but, only, but also from the fact uh, that the Greek language at that time was after a sort uh, of, uh, of development uh, which was uh, to a great extent determined by the thinking uh, of, uh, of uh, Greek philosophy. However, one thing is sure that uh, uh, the, uh, the Hebrew thinking and the Greek thinking of which the documents we have in the Bible uh, are uh, characteristically uh, different. And uh, it is very interesting uh, when uh, there is a, a movement from uh, Hebrew texts or Aramean texts, which in this sense uh, also belong to the Semitic uh, uh, languages. So when there is a movement from the Hebrew or Aramean texts uh, to the Greek texts. And then uh, one last remark concerning this question is, which, uh, which might be interesting for you because, because you study uh, in Hungary and you plan to study for some more years uh, in Hungary. And this is uh, the, the Hungarian language in many respects uh, is nearer uh, to the Hebrew language the way of thinking uh, than uh, to the Greek language. Or we could say nearer uh, to that sort uh, of languages uh, which are much more full of pictures, of analogies, uh, uh, of, we could even say, of dynamism, than those languages uh, which are much more determined by substantive substance substantives uh, by uh, by nouns which are much more static just to give you one last uh, last information uh, which uh, makes this clear is uh, that in the hebrew language originally uh, all words, almost all words, were verbs. They were verbs. It means uh, that they did not really have uh, a structure in their mind about the world, that there are things, there are stable, static things in the world, but uh, everything was a little like a person who acts. So, to give you the most uh, simple example is uh, that uh, I can not only speak about this thing, which is a table, 
that it's a statics thing, uh, I might uh, uh, speak about it, uh, that I have a contact to something that behaves like uh, a table, that acts like a table, with which uh, I can be in a, in a contraction uh, in a way. So, it could be very interesting to speak about uh, this a uh, uh, little more, but we haven't enough time for it. So we have to move to, uh, to one more important thing uh, concerning uh, the genres, literary forms, the genres uh, in the New Testament. First of all, there is a very special uh, genre in the New Testament, uh, which is called Gospel. The Gospel uh, is a narrative genre, but uh, a narrative uh, genre about the life of Jesus. It's only uh, those books uh, which were written about the life of Jesus uh, that were called uh, Gospels. There were some more Gospels uh, written than what we have in the Bible, but uh, they were judged uh, by the Christian Church as not being authentic. And we can say, uh, 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 scientific research uh, says that uh, these Gospels, uh, these non-canonical Gospels, which are not in the Bible, they really uh, were written uh, in uh, later times uh, and uh, they, uh, they uh, uh, we could say, uh, they went rather far away uh, from what originally the information uh, about uh, the life uh, of uh, uh, Jesus. Then there is uh, one more narrative book uh, in the New Testament, uh, which is not about the life of Jesus, but which is about uh, the first beginnings uh, of uh, the Christian life, of the Christian uh, community. Uh, it is uh, the so-called Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. The Apostles uh, were originally the disciples, the direct disciples uh, of Jesus, who uh, later became the first uh, leaders uh, of uh, the Christianity, of the Christian uh, communities. Then there is another genre, uh, which uh, is the letters. Letters uh, which sometimes are really uh, letters, uh, though uh, with some exceptions, uh, uh, letters not written uh, to one concrete person only, uh, but uh, to a congregation or even to several congregations, to communities. But there are some of them uh, which really are more or like uh, letters. And there are some of them uh, which, uh, which uh, have perhaps at the beginning, at the end, uh, something, uh, uh, some parts uh, which uh, resemble to a letter, uh, but uh, which are, or at least uh, of which a great part uh, are much more theological treatises. Theological treatises. And they were very important because they were the first, uh, uh, first, uh, first books, uh, the first uh, texts uh, in which uh, the essence of the new religion, of this new religion, of the Christian religion, uh, were uh, formulated. Now, uh, the greater part of these uh, letters were written by Paul or were Deuteropolian, and then you can remember we were speaking about this problem concerning the Old Testament also, when we said that it was not uh, uh, something uh, uh, like cheating uh, uh, when uh, some text uh, was uh, uh, produced uh, as the text of the book of Moses uh, or uh, uh, as uh, the prophecy of Isaiah, even if it uh, was born uh, some decades or generations later, it could happen because there was a conviction that this text is, uh, uh, in the sense, uh, according to the ideas of Isaiah, or, in this case, uh, of uh, uh, Paul, uh, of St. Paul. So there are Deuteropolian uh, letters, 
uh, also uh, which are considered by uh, historic and uh, literary critic uh, as uh, not personally written uh, by uh, Paul, but which are rather near to the thinking of Paul. And then there are also some other uh, letters which were named after some other apostles, uh, which uh, also uh, with uh, great uh, probability were not written by those concrete persons, but uh, a little later, uh, usually by the second or the third uh, generation uh, of uh, Christianity. And then there is uh, one more uh, genre or literary form uh, that exists in the uh, New Testament. Uh, this uh, is uh, the Revelation, the book of Revelation, which is uh, an apocalyptic vision and apocalyptic uh, means uh, on the one hand uh, that it speaks about some secrets uh, some enigmatic secrets uh, which are not known for others only for those uh, to whom that writing is given and it is uh, usually about the end of the world so uh, the last, uh, last point in the course uh, of the whole of the universe uh, uh, or of the creation. All right. And then now as a third point in the introduction, uh, let's come concretely to the life uh, of uh, Jesus. As I said, uh, we have uh, four Gospels uh, that were written about the life of Jesus. One important thing is uh, that these writings uh, are all not historic biographies, but they are confessions too. You can remember I told you that in fact this is true about the whole of the Bible. In fact, all of the books of the Bible, all the texts uh, were written uh, uh, at least partly in order to express uh, a concrete uh, face, uh, to express uh, something, uh, uh, a deep conviction of the person of, or of uh, a community. Now, this is true uh, for the Gospels uh, uh, too. Even in case uh, of that gospel, uh, which made the greatest efforts uh, to be very objective. That's the case uh, with the Gospel of Luke, who writes uh, in the beginning uh, of the gospel that I tried uh, to look after as much as if uh, it was possible what uh, uh, the, the, uh, the real, uh, the, uh, uh, the credible informations were concerning Jesus. Even in that case, uh, the Gospels are always uh, confessions. They tell you a story, but uh, their conviction, uh, their interpretation of that story is uh, there in the text. If I want to give you some, some, uh, some uh, uh, idea to what uh, this means, I would say uh, this is a little like... Uh, 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 your telling uh, of uh, the story of your greatest love. You say a story, it's a narration, but something, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, something uh, which, uh, which was very, very important for you about which uh, you cannot speak as about something uh, with which you had nothing to do about which you would like uh, to speak only as about somebody uh, far away uh, and just uh, looking uh, at that story. You yourself are in the story if you go on to speak about uh, your great love. Now, this is uh, the situation also with uh, the Gospels, uh, uh, telling uh, us uh, the, uh, the story of uh, uh, Jesus. Now, as I told you, uh, the first and shortest uh, confession, Christian confession, uh, consisted of just two words. Jesus Christ, or Jesus is the Christ. 
Now, if uh, uh, you try uh, to go a uh, little now back uh, and uh, uh, to, uh, if you have some uh, uh, some empathy uh, to uh, to place yourself uh, in uh, the situation of a Jewish person, you could say that uh, the most important thing uh, they were longing for many hundred years uh, was uh, the coming of the Messiah. So. It was one of the most important things uh, in the life uh, of many, many generations uh, of, uh, of uh, hoping uh, of uh, God changing the whole of their life through the person of the Messiah. And then uh, now, uh, uh, in this context, uh, in this, uh, this, uh, uh, this longing, uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, psychological uh, situation uh, of uh, looking for God uh, when the Messiah will arrive, comes somebody and says that the Messiah was here. It was the person of uh, Jesus of uh, Nazareth. So that is uh, why uh, the first uh, and shortest confession could be to say that uh, Jesus was the Christ. That Jesus who died on the cross, we shall come uh, in a short time to the concrete uh, happenings in the life of Jesus, that person was in fact the Messiah, we could say the anointed King given by God uh, to the people. And then, just to, give, to go one more step forward, uh, is to say that after some time, there will be uh, 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 a new interpretation saying that this person, this Messiah, uh, this Christ, Christ means anointed, so king, this was not only a superman, but he himself was God. That it was uh, uh, God himself who came to us, among us, uh, to redeem us, to save us, Redeemer, Savior, or to deliver us, uh, deliver us. So, that is uh, uh, in the essence uh, of uh, what was uh, the Christian understanding uh, of uh, Jesus? And it is uh, interesting and important to know that uh, at the very beginning of uh, the New Testament age, the first texts uh, that were born were not the Gospels. They were not so much uh, interested in the concrete uh, uh, happenings in the life of Jesus uh, and what Jesus said, uh, taught, uh, made this or that miracle. It was not so very important. The important thing was just one thing. It was that the, the, the Messiah was here and this means that there is a possibility of an absolutely new way of life for us. A new possibility of relation between, between God and man, and uh, also a possibility of a new relation between uh, uh, man and man, uh, uh, between uh, human, among human uh, beings. So, it will be, in fact, uh, a little later when they will uh, be thinking about that, uh, all right, uh, Jesus was here, he was the Christ, uh, he was the Messiah, he was Christ, but then, uh, in fact, uh, what do we know about him personally? What did he teach? Uh, uh, what deeds uh, of him uh, know we? And then they will go on to, to collect uh, the information uh, that survived uh, uh, in the... Uh, Two, three uh, decades, uh, it's not two, three centuries, just two, three decades after uh, Jesus was here on the earth. And uh, let's see very briefly uh, what uh, were the most important uh, happenings uh, in uh, the life of Jesus. Uh, 
Uh, we have uh, in the Gospels uh, a description of the birth uh, of uh, Jesus uh, with, uh, with uh, quite uh, some stories uh, about uh, the antecedents, uh, which means uh, the family of Jesus, uh, the mother Mary and the father Joseph, uh, and also about uh, the precursor, the precursor of Jesus, uh, who, uh, uh, who was speaking about uh, the coming of Jesus. Uh, we could also say he was the last prophet, uh, who was John the Baptist. Then we have only a very little story about uh, the childhood of Jesus, about the 12 years old Jesus. And then we have uh, quite a number of stories about uh, the public activity of Jesus. And we shall speak about this uh, in two parts. Uh, the one which I will try to tell you in this uh, uh, class, in this lecture, which are uh, the deeds of Jesus, the most important deeds of Jesus. And the second will be the teaching of Jesus. That will come uh, at the next uh, lecture, as I told you, next uh, week, next uh, Monday. And then we have uh, the most important stories about Jesus, which is about the passion and crucifixion of Jesus, his death on the cross. Uh, the cross, uh, or uh, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, 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 an instrument uh, uh, of the Romans uh, for the uh, capital uh, punishment. Uh, uh, so Jesus died on the cross, uh, and then we have stories uh, in the Gospels about the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus on the third day after his death. And then 40 days uh, being uh, uh, with uh, uh, his uh, disciples, uh, or more concretely, appearing at some occasions for, their, uh, for his uh, disciples. And then the last is the ascension of Jesus uh, is going up uh, into, the, uh, into the heaven uh, to, uh, to God. And then uh, the last uh, chapter uh, in uh, the uh, introduction, uh, it is uh, about uh, the documents what we have uh, about uh, Jesus. As I told, there are the four Gospels. Uh, and uh, we could say it's a strange thing. Why do we have four? Would it not be better to have one? On the one hand, you could say it would be much better to have one. It is uh, more along the lines of modern thinking, uh, but uh, along the, the line of biblical thinking, it is much better that we have four of them. Four of them, which means that there might be tensions, smaller uh, differences between uh, what you read in one or in the other uh, gospel, but it is uh, like having four instead of one photo about a person. I think it's absolutely clear. You know much better uh, a person if you have four photos uh, made from four different uh, points of views by four different persons uh, than just have one. I'm just smiling because uh, the, uh, the only person who actually is here now, uh, my colleague, uh, is a photographer, so I think he can really very well understand this, uh, but I have to say that uh, uh, even if I speak not to photographers, that's, uh, that's what, I, what I always say because I think uh, it explains really something important uh, about why is it good if you have four Gospels. Now, uh, three of these four Gospels are called the so-called Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic uh, comes uh, from a, a Greek word which means uh, to see uh, together, which means uh, to uh, see in a similar way. It simply means that the first three Gospels, that of Matthew, Mark and Luke, they are similar to each other. A great part of uh, the material what we find in these Gospels, uh, uh, they are similar. Uh, it is not the case uh, with the fourth Gospel, which is that of Joan. 
which is similar only uh, in uh, uh, the most important part, the passion, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is similar to the other Gospels, but as far as the other parts uh, of uh, uh, the Gospel of John is concerned, uh, it tells you uh, in many respects uh, different, uh, uh, different stories, uh, not all, there are some uh, which are uh, the same uh, uh, or uh, some modifications of those that we have in the Synoptic uh, uh, Gospels, but the greater part uh, of the stories and teachings of Jesus are different from uh, the other one. And we can say, uh, as far as uh, uh, historic uh, um, research is concerned, we can say that the Gospel of John consists uh, of texts uh, which were written later and which uh, historically are further away from the history of Jesus than what we have uh, in the Synoptic uh, Gospels. Uh, also, it, is in, it might be interesting to know, just very briefly, uh, that uh, generally, uh, after very, very much work on the texts uh, of the Synoptic uh, Gospels, uh, we can say that they probably had two sources. One source was a so-called proto-mark, which means uh, uh, the gospel uh, from which uh, the now existing gospel of Mark uh, was made, but it was a prior uh, state uh, uh, of the text in the development, which might have been one of the sources, and the other is the so-called Q source, uh, that comes from the German word Quelle, uh, which simply means in German source, uh, and which consisted uh, exclusively of uh, the teaching, of the sayings uh, of Jesus. Uh, yes. Uh, and then, uh, if you ask, uh, all right, and we have this text, it's, uh, it's quite, quite a quantity of text, uh, but how far is, is, uh, is it historically reliable, how far is it objective or not, then what we can say is that uh, in the history of interpretation uh, there were all existing uh, extremities. Uh, beginning uh, from uh, each word is uh, concretely a historic uh, reality, to saying that uh, there wasn't even uh, ever living a person called uh, Jesus. It was all forged uh, from, uh, from different theological ideas. Now, between the extremities, uh, uh, we can say that uh, probably, we can only speak about probability, but we can say that the essence, uh, what we find, at least in the uh, Synoptic Gospels, uh, is uh, historically uh, reliable, but with uh, quite uh, a lot of interpretation being there in the text, uh, with supplements, uh, with uh, some modifications. All right, and then now let's come uh, to the concrete texts. Uh, first, uh, the so-called Christmas stories. What is Christmas? Uh, is one of uh, the great feasts of Christian religion. Uh, it is uh, uh, it is the feast uh, of the birth uh, of uh, Jesus. Generally, I would say to you, it's an interesting thing uh, that uh, uh, in many parts of the Christian world, uh, Christmas is the most popular uh, Christian feast. However, I have to tell you that it is not the main Christian fe uh, feast. The main Christian feast, uh, it is... Uh, in fact, uh, a series uh, of feasts uh, at the top of which uh, is Easter. So, as uh, the essence uh, of uh, the story of Jesus uh, was the passion, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, among the feasts, the most important uh, ones uh, are that are centered around uh, these happenings. 
So we have, however, uh, Christmas, which in fact also was uh, 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 as a feast. Uh, it was elaborated in the history of the liturgy of the Christian churches uh, uh, much later, not from the very beginning, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, in the third, fourth century. Uh, and uh, we could say that uh, the stories uh, which we have uh, about the birth of Jesus, uh, they are, however, very interesting because uh, there are different emphases uh, at one and the other uh, of uh, the uh, Gospels. In case uh, of uh, the Gospel of Luke, which we will begin to read in two minutes. Uh, it is centered around uh, the family uh, of uh, Jesus and also of uh, John the Baptist and the, uh, the, the history, the family of John uh, the Baptist. In case of Matthew, uh, who was first of all uh, writing his gospel for Jews, for such Christians, who were originally Jews and who, in a sense, they remain Jews because if they were born Jews, then they remain Jews, but they became Christians. So, for Matthew, the most important thing is uh, uh, to say that uh, Jesus is the son of uh, David and Abraham. So, the genealogy which leads back uh, Jesus uh, to the most important personalities uh, in uh, the Old Testament uh, story. Well, to two of them, not Moses, uh, but to David and Abraham. And then in case of John, we have uh, a rather abstract uh, uh, Greek type, uh, religious philosophical uh, meditation and ideas, where Jesus uh, Christ will be interpreted uh, as the Logos, the Word, the message, the consciousness uh, of uh, God himself. And so he begins uh, his story of Jesus uh, before the creation of uh, the world. All right, and uh, now let us uh, begin uh, to read uh, the story about the birth of Jesus uh, from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses from 1 to 20. I have to say that unfortunately uh, no, we cannot uh, see it uh, on the screen or uh, projected. Uh, in fact, uh, as I could see it uh, from the video made uh, at the previous uh, occasion. Uh, it was not uh, in such a good uh, quality that it could have been used by you really very well. But I hope uh, if uh, you are there at home, uh, you can without uh, any problem have uh, the text uh, from uh, your laptop. So we are going to read uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 2, verses uh, from 1 uh, to uh, 20. In those days, a decree was issued by the Emperor Augustus for a registration to be made throughout the Roman world. This was the first registration of its kind. It took place when Quirinius was governor of Syria. You see, it begins by giving a concrete time and concrete place which means, and it's again very important, uh, that it's not like a myth. The myth in a religion is always somewhere in eternity. You cannot uh, say that it is here or there on the globe uh, or in the time. Now, in case of the Gospel, it tells you that it is something which really happened. And it happened in the age of Augustus and Quirinius and in Syria, etc., etc. For this purpose, uh, everyone made his way to his own town. And so Joseph went up to Judea from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to register at the city of David called Bethlehem 
because he was of the house of David by descent. Galilee uh, was a, a province uh, of the Romans, uh, north uh, from Judea. Uh, in fact, uh, between Galilee and Judea, you had uh, one more Roman province, but it means that they had to go a rather long way uh, from uh, Nazareth uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Bethlehem. And with him, with Joseph, uh, went Mary, who was betrothed to him. She was expecting a child, and while they were there, the time came for her, for, for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in his swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them to lodge in the house. So it means uh, then we are dropped uh, into a situation which is characterized uh, by, uh, by poverty, even we could say uh, by misery, that there, are, there is a traveling family uh, who uh, arrive somewhere in, uh, uh, in far away uh, from their country, and uh, they, are, they even do not have the possibility to have a, a normal roof over their head uh, to stay. And the pregnant woman uh, can go uh, only uh, to such a situation uh, that uh, she will be able uh, to lay his uh, son in a manger. Which means uh, that uh, Jesus does not arrive into the top of the society, but at the very top, at the very uh, bottom of, his, of it. This will be uh, uh, even more emphasized uh, in the next uh, sentences. When we read, now in this same district uh, there were shepherds out in the fields keeping watch through the night over their flock, when suddenly there stood before them an angel of the Lord, and the splendor of the Lord shone round them. Shepherds. Again, uh, people who belong uh, to uh, the layers of the society which are there, uh, there uh, in, uh, in a rather low situation. But for this uh, shepherd, they're done, comes uh, from the highest point, uh, uh, the angel, and the splendor of the Lord shone around them. They were terror-stricken, but the angel said, Do not be afraid. I have good news for you. There is a great joy coming to the whole people. Today in the city of David a deliverer has been born to you, the Messiah, the Lord. So, I have good news for you. It is good to know that the good news uh, in uh, Greek is evangelion, and from this uh, word we have the word evangelion, uh, which uh, uh, almost in, uh, in, mo uh, in most languages uh, it is the word for gospel. It's a special thing with the English that they use the word uh, gospel, but this genre is called evangelion uh, almost in all other uh, languages. So, who will be born uh, in the city of David, of the king, a deliverer, you remember deliverer or savior or redeemer, this is uh, Jesus Christ, has been born, and then you have the, who is he? He is the Messiah and the Lord, that again which will be a word, which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, is used in the Gospel about Christ. But for whom was used before the Lord? The Lord in the Old Testament is God, is Yahweh himself. So you have everything in a very brief way uh, in these uh, uh, few sentences. And this is your sign. You will find a baby 
lying wrapped in his waddling clothes in a manger. Again, you go back. You, know, you feel how you go up to the highest point and then back to the lowest point, to the manger. All at once there was with the angel a great company of heavenly hosts. Again, there up, singing the praises of God. Glory to God in highest heaven and on earth his peace for men on whom his favor rests. We do not have too much time, so I just tell you to read for you or your own uh, the next uh, six, verses, six verses where you find simply that uh, the shepherds go really to Bethlehem and they, they find uh, Mary and Joseph uh, and the little Jesus uh, and they tell uh, them about uh, what uh, happened uh, to uh, them. Uh, what is important now uh, with this story uh, will be uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, not only one important barrier is broken uh, between human beings, uh, the very, very big, strong barrier which exists uh, between king and shepherd or king uh, as somebody in misery uh, uh, in, the ma in the manger. But in fact, uh, this uh, is a sign uh, of uh, the whole development uh, of Christian religion uh, uh, where a fundamental motive uh, will be uh, the breaking through of all possible barriers uh, which uh, exist uh, between people. So, the barrier between rich and poor, between men and women, this will be very important. You might remember uh, once we were speaking about this uh, uh, at the very beginning of, uh, of uh, uh, the story about the sin with uh, Eve and Adam. And then uh, Breaking through is also uh, the barrier between Jews and non-Jews, or heathens, and also between master and slave. In the first Christian congregations, you will have the majority slaves, but some exceptionally rich persons were there too, and some powerful persons. So it means we are all equal in the eye of God. Our differences among human beings, all the differences, are of no importance as far as the essence is concerned. As far as the most important questions of human life are concerned, these differences are of no importance. Um, yes, sir. And then I think uh, uh, we can move now to uh, one other uh, story about uh, the birth of, Je of uh, Jesus, which will be uh, from uh, the Gospel of Matthew. So look at uh, the Gospel of Matthew on your laptop. Chapter 1, and we shall begin to read it from verse 18. Chapter 1, verse 18. This is the story of the birth of the Messiah. Matthew, reading for the Jews, begins the whole saying that this will be about the Messiah. Mary, his mother, was betrothed to Joseph. We know it also from Luke. Before their marriage, she found that she was uh, with child by the Holy Spirit. Being a man of principle, and at the same time wanting to save her, it means Mary, from exposure, Joseph desired to have the marriage contract set aside uh, quietly. Now this is uh, a real drama. Uh, you can imagine uh, uh, Joseph and Mary were betrothed only. They were not uh, husband and wife. Uh, so there was no intercourse between them. And Mary uh, has uh, a child. 
What can this mean? Uh, you can say, uh, uh, according to normal thinking, it means uh, that Mary did something which was absolutely unacceptable, and it might have been possible, uh, it, 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 it would have been the normal course of things, uh, of Joseph uh, making a, a great scandal of the thing, uh, which could have uh, led even to the death uh, of uh, Mary. What we reach here is... Uh, it's a little strange formulation that Joseph was a man of principle. Uh, we uh, we read in other uh, uh, in other translations that he was a righteous man. He was a good man. So uh, he thought uh, that we could uh, they could depart uh, in a way that it should not be a, a scandal uh, so much uh, for uh, for uh, Mary. However, what we have here a bit. Uh, uh, Behind the whole story is that it is very important for Christian understanding uh, to say that the child was by the Holy Spirit. So, in order to express uh, the idea uh, that uh, uh, Jesus is not simply, not simply a very good man, uh, the best man in the world, uh, the greatest prophet, the greatest king, but even more than that, uh, this is clearly demonstrated by this, that the child was from the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, as we saw, it was important that what happens is in the history. It's not a myth, it's not philosophy, it is reality uh, which was in this world. And so it was important uh, to say that he is the son of David, he is really uh, the Messiah. And uh, in order uh, to have this, uh, uh, it was important that his father be Joseph. Somebody, a person, who came from the family of David. So in fact, if you want to have both, then this is the only possibility to express this. Uh, so it means that Jesus is uh, the legal heir of uh, King uh, David. And then uh, we go further saying, he had resolved on this when an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Again an angel, like in the Gospel of Luke. An angel of the Lord, and we have the word uh, Lord here for the God, for God, which was uh, used uh, uh, before uh, in the other gospel for Jesus. So the two are uh, are there, very uh, near to each other. Joseph, son of David, said the angel, "Do not be afraid to take Mary home with you as your wife. It is by the Holy Spirit." that she has conceived this child. She will bear a, a son, and you shall give him the name Jesus, uh, or Savior, uh, we have in brackets, uh, so it's uh, the English word for what Jesus means. For he will save his people from their sins. All this happened in order to fulfill what the Lord declared through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and bear a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel, Emmanuel, a name which means God is with us. Emmanuel, it's a word by word, means in the Hebrew language this God is with us. Rising from sleep, Joseph did as the angel had directed him. He took Mary home to be his wife, but had no intercourse with her until her son was born, and he named the child uh, Jesus. All right, uh, and then uh, let's uh, see what happens uh, after. Jesus was born at Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of Herod. After his birth, uh, astrologers uh, from the east arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who is born to be the king of Jews? Of the Jews? We observed the rising of his star 
and we have come to pay him uh, homage. King Herod was greatly perturbed when he heard this, and so was the whole of Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the chief priests and lawyers of the Jewish people and put before them the question, where is it that the Messiah is to be born? At Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, and they referred him to the prophecy which reads, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, you are far from least in the eyes of the rulers of Judah. For, our, for out of you shall come a leader to be the shepherd of my people Israel. Now, what remark is, uh, you could, uh, you could uh, uh, notice uh, that uh, every now and then uh, we have uh, something like, this happened uh, in order to fulfill what God said. This was uh, in order to fulfill uh, the prophecy which we are adherent here. It's every now and then we have this throughout the whole of uh, the... Gospel of Matthew uh, that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, it uh, it makes uh, uh, an allusion to one or the other of uh, of uh, the Old Testament stories. Uh, I just have to ask my colleague if uh, uh, he says it's ten minutes, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the record goes further. No, or only for so. It might be a little uh, uh, longer now, this uh, class, the one and a half hours, uh, but I think you will be very happy with it. And this is uh, about uh, Jesus, so it's especially of importance for us now. So, here the next called the astrologers to meet him in private and ascertained from them the time when the star had appeared. He then sent them uh, on to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful inquiry for the child. When you have found him, report to me, so that I may go myself and pay him homage. Perhaps uh, even who never heard about this story uh, can have some ideas uh, if it's uh, really uh, to pay homage uh, what Herod wants uh, uh, to do or not. Because uh, he is the king now there, which means he's under the Roman uh, uh, emperor, but he's king of that part uh, of, uh, uh, of the land. And uh, they say that uh, the king of the Jews was born. So they, it means the astrologers, set out at the king's uh, uh, bidding. And the star which they had seen at its rising went ahead of them until it stopped above the place where the child lay. At the sight of the star they were overjoyed. Entering the halls, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and bowed to the ground in homage to him. Then they opened their treasures and offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned home another way. After they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said to him, Rise up, take the child and his mother, and escape with them to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to do away with him. So Joseph rose from sleep, and taking mother and child by night, he went away with them to Egypt, and there he stayed till Herod's death. This was to fulfill what the Lord had declared through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. When Herod saw how the astrologers had tricked him, he fell into passion, and gave orders for the massacre of all children in Bethlehem and its neighborhood of the age of two years or less, corresponding with the time he had ascertained from the astrologers. So the words spoken through Jeremiah, the prophet, were fulfilled, 
A voice was heard in Roma, wailing and low laments. It was Rachel weeping for her children and refusing all consolation because there they were no more. So you arrive into the heart of history and into the uh, horrible nature of history of how people uh, tackle their life and their relations uh, with each other. Uh, we arrived uh, to a massacre, a massacre of children. And this, in a sense, uh, I think symbolizes uh, what, uh, according uh, to the view of the Bible, human beings uh, are capable to do uh, without uh, uh, God. To struggle against each other, to make wars uh, and to make uh, massacres. All right, and then we go further to another text uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, chapter 4, verses 12 to 17. When he, is Jesus, heard that John had been arrested, Jesus withdrew to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and settled uh, at uh, Capernaum, on the Sea of Galilee, in the district uh, of uh, Zebulon and uh, Naphtali. This was to fulfill the passage in the prophet Isaiah, which tells of the land of Zebulon and land of uh, Naphtali, the way of the sea, the land beyond Jordan, hasten Galilee, and says, The people that lived in darkness saw a great light. Light dawned on the dwellers in the land of death, dark shadow. From that day, Jesus began to proclaim the message, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is upon you. Once again, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is upon you. This is, in fact, we could say, the program of Jesus. With this uh, and with everything that follows from this, uh, he will begin uh, his uh, public uh, activity. And uh, now uh, we shall turn to uh, the Gospel according to Mark. And we shall uh, read a very interesting uh, story, or we could say two stories, uh, wrapped up in one story, uh, two stories of uh, healings, which was one of the most uh, important things uh, what Jesus was doing. As far as the dates, the activity of Jesus is concerned, uh, uh, a very great part of the stories uh, is about how Jesus uh, healed a lot of people. It means people of all rank uh, and all sorts uh, of people, uh, uh, people uh, sometimes also rich or powerful, or people uh, from uh, uh, the most miserable situation, widows uh, and very poor people, uh, and uh, even uh, Jews and non-Jews. So, in fact, all sorts of human beings appear as persons who were healed uh, by uh, Jesus. Now, let's uh, read the text uh, from, uh, as I told, verse 21. As soon as Jesus had returned by boat uh, to the other shore uh, of the Sea of Galilee, a great crowd once more gathered round him. While he was uh, by the lakeside, the president of one of the synagogues came up, uh, so rather powerful person, president of the synagogue, J. Uh, Iris uh, by name, and when he saw him, threw himself down at his feet and pleaded with him. My little daughter, he said, is at death's door. I beg you to come and lay your hands on her to cure her and save her life. So Jesus went with him 
accompanied by a great crowd which pressed upon him. Among them was a woman who had suffered from uh, hemorrhages for twelve years, and in spite of long treatment by many doctors, on which she had spent all she had, there had been no improvement. On the contrary, she had grown worse. She had heard what people were saying about Jesus, so she came up from behind in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said to herself, If I touch even his clothes, I shall be cured. And there and then the source of her hemorrhages dried up, and she knew in herself that she was cured of her trouble. At the same time, Jesus, aware that power had gone out of him, turned round in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing up on you, and you ask uh, who touched me, meaning uh, there are many, many people who touched him in the crowd. Uh, Meanwhile, he was looking, or Jesus was looking round to see who had done it. And the woman, trembling with fear, when she grasped what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and told him the whole truth. He said to her, My daughter, your faith has cured you. Go in peace free forever from uh, this uh, trouble. So what happened? Jesus uh, sets on the road uh, to go to cure somebody, and then there is another person coming. And then now he will follow the road, as we shall, uh, we shall uh, read, but it is something which, uh, which very well symbolizes uh, what Jesus does. When uh, uh, healing uh, different uh, people uh, coming asking his uh, his uh, his help, and that these healings uh, are interwoven one into the other, one rolling after the other, even mixing up uh, uh, one with the other, as uh, we read uh, in this case. So while he was still speaking, a message came from the president's house: "Your daughter is dead." Why trouble the rabbi further? But Jesus, overhearing the message as it was delivered, said to the president of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only have faith. After this, uh, he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James, and James's brother, John. They came to the president's house, where he found a great commotion with loud crying and wailing. So he went in and said to them, Why this crying and commotion? The child is not dead, she is asleep. And they only laughed at him. Because they were clever, because they knew very well what is possible, what can happen in the world. But uh, after turning all the others out, he took the child's father and mother and his own companions and went in where the child was lying. Then, taking hold of her hand, he said to her, Talita kum, which means, Get up, my child. Immediately, the girl got up and walked about. She was twelve years old. At that, they were beside themselves with amazement. He gave them strict orders to let no one hear about it and told them to give her something to eat. Now uh, we are just some minutes uh, after the normal ending of uh, the class uh, and there is uh, one last uh, story uh, which I think we shall uh, read uh, at our next uh, lecture. So please don't forget uh, uh, that uh, next Monday again there will be a lecture and uh, uh, put uh, on video. 
Uh, and then I also would like to say, but I will write uh, to you it also uh, through, uh, uh, through uh, our letter that uh, I would be grateful uh, if you just sent me a small message that Professor OK, everything arrived and we could use it and we could understand and hear it. Uh, and naturally, uh, you can uh, write me about uh, any other comment uh, or question, uh, anything uh, uh, you want. Uh, goodbye for now.